General George Cabot Marshall was one of the truly great leaders of the Second World War. As Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army throughout the war, he was my father's immediate superior and good friend. It was, in fact, General Marshall who recommended Dad as Supreme Commander in North Africa and Europe and fully supported him. Along with Winston Churchill, Dad considered him to be one of the few greats of our time. General Eisenhower frequently referred to General Marshall as a true American patriot and as the most selfless man he had ever known. It's interesting to note that General Marshall was not a graduate of West Point, but rather a VMI, the Virginia Military Institute. He was a distinguished soldier and a fine gentleman and went on to become Secretary of State and author of the Marshall Plan. The Marshall family had settled in southwestern Pennsylvania a few years before George Catlett was born in 1880. At Uniontown, he entered a slow-moving world that was more a part of the past than of the future. Marshall's boyhood passed quietly, and the only contact this serious child had with the army he would someday serve came secondhand through his father's recollections of the Civil War. America's Indian frontier had only recently been tamed. And the stories of Carson and Custer were still fresh enough to excite the imagination of any boy. Looking backward over the years, it's hard to find the precise reason why young George Marshall decided to make the Army his profession. But choose it he did, and he began his soldiering at a soldier's school. The Virginia Military Institute had trained many distinguished Army men before George Marshall arrived in September 1897. It once boasted Stonewall Jackson as a member of its faculty. The MI provided the kind of environment calculated to encourage a young man with Army ambitions, and Marshall in his four years at the school rose to cadet first captain. He was an honor graduate with a reputation for military skill and knowledge which was to follow him throughout his Army career. He was a young man with a passion for facts and the ability to apply them imaginatively. Commissioned an infantry second lieutenant in 1901, Marshall shortly found himself on troop duty in the Philippines. Assignments in Oklahoma Territory, Texas, Massachusetts, and the Fort Leavenworth Staff College filled the early years. He studied and soldiered, and by the time the United States began to mobilize for war in 1916, George Marshall had become a captain in the regular army. He landed in France with the first American troops, and as a member of the 1st Division staff, he helped plan the Battle of Cantigny. Chief of Operations prior to the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, Marshall planned the successful movement of almost a million troops, which made the great Allied breakthrough possible. Marshall had helped engineer the final victory. Shown here with General Henry Allen, Marshall had risen to full colonel, and his enormous contributions to staff planning were being widely recognized. His work on the Meuse-Argonne Offensive brought Pershing's personal commendation. The man who designed the Meuse-Argonne victory takes a moment to pose with other staff officers in France. His reputation for brilliance distinguished him among his staff colleagues. Marshall emerged from World War I as one of the most promising young officers in the Army. Assigned as aide to General Pershing, Marshall's work kept him in close contact with the AEF commander during the last days in Europe. On a post-war battlefield tour, Marshall calls one officer's attention to the cameraman. Signal Corps photographers covering Pershing's activities little realized that the lean young colonel at his side would someday be as newsworthy a figure as the illustrious Black Jack Pershing. 
In the late summer of 1919, General Pershing bid farewell to France and boarded the Leviathan for America. With him went Colonel George Marshall. Proud of the reputation he had acquired as a military planning brain, disappointed in the fact that he had been considered too valuable to spare for the combat command he coveted. Pershing recommended Marshall's promotion to brigadier, but the war's end prevented it. The two things most important to a professional soldier's career, command and promotion, had been denied Marshall, either through unfortunate timing or because the talents he possessed were considered too precious to squander on the battlefield. Marshall's return was a time of triumph and frustration. He had learned the business of war in a tough school, and he knew it as few others did. But there was small pleasure in the knowledge. Long after the noise and the shouting, when this gay harbor scene had passed into memory and the world would once again take up arms, Marshall would be ready. But as the Leviathan docked in New York, he was still an obscure staff officer with a cinder in his eye. Following Pershing meant a constant round of official appearances. These were the years when American defense policies affecting the future security of the nation were being decided. The post-war role of the Army was debated by both military and political leaders. Pershing believed in a tight, hard, professional force backed by a large citizen army. In Marshall, he found an enthusiastic supporter. It was this kind of army which had brought victory out of Europe in 1918. As a member of Pershing's Washington staff, Marshall devoted much effort during the next four years toward a realization of the citizen army goal. In 1924, brought duty with the 15th Infantry Regiment in Tinsen, China. With the commanding officer of the 15th, Colonel Newell, Marshall posed for a rare picture in Mufti. This was his first actual troop assignment in almost 10 years. The 15th Infantry was operating well enough when Marshall joined it as executive officer. But by the time he left, it had become a crack outfit. In the middle 20s, China was fragmented by civil war and revolution, and the private armies of Chinese warlords fought in all parts of the land for national advantage. The mission of the 15th Infantry was to help protect both American trading concessions and American lives. It was a tense but quiet assignment for Marshall, and before he finished his tour, the 15th had acquired a reputation for smart appearance and snappy precision. It could outperform and outshine every other garrison regiment in Tencent. Distinguished faculty at the Fort Benning Infantry School, which included future generals Bradley, Stilwell, and Collins, was under Marshall's direction from 1927 to 1931. When he took over the school, one of the most important in the Army, he found much of the instruction had fallen behind the times. But this hard-driving man with the passion for facts was not satisfied to refight old wars. It was the present and the future which concerned him, and he revised the curriculum accordingly. During the 30s, the world caught fire, ignited by a handful of global arsonists who enjoyed their work. Germany threatened to even the score for her defeat in 1918. On the other side of the world, the Japanese were introducing their neighbors to their own brand of arson. China felt the brutal aggression directed by the Japanese warlords. The Japanese onslaught of China carried out the ambitions and aspirations of a nation bent on territorial conquest. while many of us laughed at a comic opera character speaking from a Roman balcony. But his intended victims in Ethiopia did not laugh. 
They were a proud and fierce people determined to resist the Italian dictator's aggression. Benito Mussolini invaded the tiny African kingdom anyway, and another piece of earth caught fire. An appeal was made, but no one came forward to answer it. Mussolini demonstrated for his friends how easy it was. The day Germany invaded Poland, George Marshall, then a brigadier general, made the extraordinary jump from one to four stars to become the army chief of staff. With Secretary of War Stimson, the task of mobilization lay ahead. The resources of a mighty nation had to be tapped to produce the props for the great drama about to unfold. Marshall had waited in the wings for 20 years for the role he was about to play. The country's manpower resources, the great citizen army in which Marshall believed so deeply, had to be activated, trained, and equipped to fight if necessary. And with each passing month in 1940 and 41, it appeared increasingly probable that the United States would be drawn into the war. The army numbered less than 200,000 men when Marshall took over as chief of staff. It would swell to more than 8 million before the Axis defeat. The accumulated experience from the early days in the Philippines, Cantigny and the Meuse Argonne, from the staff work with Pershing and the seasoning in China, from Fort Benning to the National Guard and the CCC during the Depression. The sum total was imaginatively applied by George Marshall in directing the American Army during the war. It was as if every single year of his career in some way related to the monumental task he undertook. The American military buildup was just beginning to gain momentum when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. At an inspection of the Army's new airborne troops at Fort Bragg in 1942, Marshall gets a close-up view of the citizen soldier at work. Field soldiers never knew when the chief of staff might make an appearance such as this one at the Jungle Warfare Training Center in Hawaii. Marshall might do his thinking and planning in Washington, but it was from the field that he drew his facts. A gifted observer, the smallest detail did not escape him. Army subordinates were either proud or dismayed by Marshall's critical appraisal, depending upon the performance. Jungle training was a new experience for American troops, but it was clear from the beginning that in order to win the war in the Pacific, our soldiers had to beat the Japanese at their own game. In the forbidding gray of a November dawn in 1942, American naval vessels ghosted in toward the beaches of North Africa, delivering the first major Allied counterattack since the outbreak of the war. Their objective? the German Africa Corps in Tunisia. The enemy was led by Germany's ingenious field marshal, Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. His veterans already had been baptized by the battle-toughened British Tommies. Desperately, with everything they had, the Germans fought to keep from being pushed into the sea. When the Allied military advisors convened at Casablanca in January 1943, the North African campaign had become tough and bitter, but the achievement of a unified Allied command was part of the ultimate victory. Marshall had worked tirelessly to achieve a smooth-running command organization at the highest American level. He held the president's trust and regard, and was consulted on every critical decision affecting the conduct of the war. Marshall's diplomatic skill helped reconcile many opposing points of view with British leaders during the Casablanca Conference. From the North African meetings came the Allied decision to bomb Germany around the clock. American B-17s helped carry the war to the German backyard. <laughs> 
The decision to invade Sicily also was reached, and in July of 1943, Americans and British jumped off from Africa on the preliminary leg to the first assault on Fortress Europe, the Italian mainland. A strong partisan for the Women's Army Corps, as important to our mobilization, the Chief of Staff made it a point to be in Washington the day Colonel Obita Kop Hobby was sworn in as its new commander. By the time the Allied leaders convened at Cairo in December 1943, the Italian campaign was well underway and the war against the Japanese demanded stepped-up operations. The future of the China-Burma-India theater and the problem of harnessing China's manpower had to be resolved. At Tehran, Marshall took part in planning joint strategy with the Russians. Soviet demands for an expanded second front were addressed to the United States. It was George Marshall who answered them. When the Chief of Staff visited the Pacific Theater on his return from Tehran, our offensive was gaining speed. Island by island, we were moving in on Japan. At Good Enough Island in 1944, Marshall listened to a first-hand report on the successful operations in the Gilbert Islands and the planned invasion of the Marshalls. Marshall conferred with General Douglas MacArthur, theater commander, as the Allies were gearing for the big Pacific push which would carry them to the very doorstep of Japan. Italy had become a slow and painful struggle. The road to Rome was a long one, and for Marshall and his wife, one of extreme personal anxiety. As a tank commander under Patton, Marshall's stepson had been engaged in the heaviest fighting for weeks. When the Americans finally broke through the lines of a stubborn enemy, the young officer fought his last fight. For General Marshall, the war had turned into a personal tragedy. When the spring of 1944 brought the long-planned invasion of France, Marshall accompanied General Eisenhower and other high-ranking officers ashore for an inspection of the American positions on the Normandy beachhead. Fifteen stars fill this corporal's jeep as Admiral King and Generals Marshall, Bradley, and Eisenhower ride out to survey the battle damage. On this trip, Marshall takes a few moments to visit an old friend, the colorful ex-cavalryman Patton, whose fast-moving armored columns had many times torn great holes in the German defenses. Marshall considered Patton one of the ablest field commanders in the army and the Chief of Staff had personally ordered the Mercurial General to his original combat assignment in North Africa. The subsequent performance of the troops under Patton's command confirmed General Marshall's wise choice. Allied planners met again in 1944, this time at Quebec. A decision was reached to move the invasion of the Philippines three months ahead of schedule. Marshall returned from Quebec to fly immediately to Paris with Secretary of State James Burns for another meeting with General Eisenhower. The Chief of Staff was involved with the vast and complicated problem of our global supply lines, and he chose to inspect the divisions poised for the final thrust into Germany. A minor slack in the line of supply at this moment could cause a major military disaster. And Marshall knew all these facts at both ends of the line. The price of victory was far too high to risk delay. The trip to Europe provided Marshall with another opportunity, a chance to talk with the troops. He spoke informally to American soldiers who had faced the toughest test in history and triumph. Marshall inspected their positions within range of the enemy, his last close look before the Axis collapsed. World War II ended with the final capitulation of Japan. When President Truman presented Marshall with the Distinguished Service Medal in 1945, 
He said that although millions gave America extraordinary service, Marshall gave it victory. 1945 also saw Marshall dispatched to China as the president's special representative to negotiate a truce between Chiang Kai-shek and the communists. General Eisenhower, then chief of staff, visited his former boss during the negotiations. This was the first time Marshall officially functioned as a diplomat, but the role was not unfamiliar. Although the army had been his profession, his country's interest had always been his career. Marshall received the oath of office as Secretary of State from Chief Justice Vinson early in 1947. The president enthusiastically endorsed the former Chief of Staff at a critical time in history. It was fairly said that Mr. Truman selected him not because of his experience, but because he was Marshall. There's nothing that I can say at this time regarding matters that pertain to my position in the State Department. But I assume the duties with a great, with a feeling of great responsibility and a very earnest desire to carry out the foreign policy of this government in the manner that uh, has been so uh, splendidly exemplified by my predecessor, uh, Mr. Burns, my old friend. The new secretary brought imagination and a dignified intensity to his job, which was equal to the world challenge. In March 1947, Marshall headed a delegation to Moscow, whose mission was the peace agreement on Germany and Austria. The opportunity to observe the Russian bear in his native environment was valuable in view of increasing Soviet hostility. Russia already loomed as the largest question mark in America's future. The desperate economic plight of Europe drew Marshall's whole attention upon his return, and his recommendations were presented to the Congress. Europe is still emerging from the devastation and dislocation of the most destructive war in history. Within its own resources, Europe cannot achieve, within a reasonable time, economic stability. The solution would be much easier, of course, if all the nations of Europe were cooperating, but they are not. Far from cooperating, the Soviet Union and the Communist parties have proclaimed their determined opposition to a plan for European economic recovery. Economic distress is to be employed to further political ends. There are many who accept the picture that I have just drawn, but who raise a further question. Why must the United States carry so great a load in helping Europe? The answer is simple. The United States is the only country in the world today which has the economic power and productivity to furnish the needed assistance. The six and eight tenth billion proposed for the first 15 months is less than a single month's charge of the war. To be quite clear, this unprecedented endeavor of the new world to help the old is neither sure nor easy. It is a calculated risk. It is a difficult program, and you know far better than I do the political difficulties involved in this program. But there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. The great rubble heaps left by the war were soon diminished by an American investment in international friendship and goodwill, which also proved to be an effective economic weapon against spreading communism, the Marshall Plan. Offered on a self-help basis, Marshall Plan Aid enabled many war-ravaged countries to regain their first foothold on a stable peacetime economy. Trade and production were stimulated, and communist plans which were dependent upon poverty and despair for their success were thwarted in many parts of the world. George Marshall resigned as Secretary of State in January 1949, intending to relax for the first time in almost 50 years. But the National Red Cross called upon him for one further task in the public interest when it asked him to serve as its head. Meeting with Polio Foundation Chief Basil O'Connor at the White House, Marshall outlined his plans for this vast mercy organization. Less than one year later, the president persuaded him to return to the government as Secretary of Defense. 
He flew to Korea where he met with General Ridgway and other UN leaders. The man with the passion for facts was gathering them firsthand. This was a different American army than Marshall had known, and a different kind of war. The citizen soldier did the fighting in Korea, but this time under a UN banner and for a limited objective. Washington, Marshall assumed the critical responsibility for all of the men and material necessary for victory in Korea. The peculiar circumstances of the conflict called for the existence of large American forces without total mobilization in the United States. Once more, George Marshall, the statesman, distinguished himself. Relaxation was rare for the busy cabinet member, but to the delight of a pretty queen, he did manage to officiate at the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival in 1951. On the 50th anniversary of his graduation, VMI paid tribute to General Marshall with a day named in his honor. Many of his old classmates came to Lexington to applaud the school's most distinguished graduates and to recall their years as members of the cadet corps. After a howitzer salute to the soldier statesman, the entire body of cadets stood at attention while Marshall was awarded Virginia's Distinguished Service Medal by Governor John Battle. Then, the man whose life represents the highest ideals of the cadet corps inspected the ranks of men who may be tomorrow's leaders. George Catlett Marshall resigned from the Defense Department and settled in Leesburg, Virginia in 1951. His public service spanned a critical half-century for our country, placing him in the ranks of great American patriots. General Henry H. Arnold, better known as Hap, was an early Army flyer and pioneer. He served under General Marshall as Commanding General and Chief of the Army Air Corps, which later became the Army Air Force. General Arnold oversaw the amazing expansion of American air power from a handful of aircraft, 4,000 planes, and 23,000 men at the start of the war to an awesome 230,000 planes and 2,400,000 personnel in the spring of 1945. Both he and General Marshall were raised to five-star or General of the Army rank at the same time as Generals MacArthur and Eisenhower. In 1909, a frail contraption was flown across the English Channel by Louis Blerio. What this little plane could do impressed a young American who began to wonder even then about the military effects of not one, but many flying machines in the air at the same time. That young lieutenant was Henry Hap Arnold. He was to become the commanding general of the greatest air force in history. Two and a half million men and 70,000 aircraft. In 1911, when getting a heavier-than-air machine aloft was still something of a miracle, Second Lieutenant Hap Arnold was engaged in a project having nothing at all to do with flight and everything to do with launching his military career. He was trying very hard to become a first lieutenant. Meanwhile, the discovery of the Wright brothers was becoming increasingly interesting to the United States Army. The spirit of the Wright brothers, that a practical answer could be found to almost any problem, was to be an inspiration to Hap throughout his life. The Wrights made it seem that anything was possible, creating an enthusiasm among young aeronauts that was sometimes carried to extremes. When Hap volunteered to learn to fly, his CO said, I know of no better way for a person to commit suicide. Skeptical as many were, the Signal Corps had made concrete plans to obtain the necessary planes for a course of instruction. 
In school at the Wright Brothers Field at Dayton, Hap labeled all the parts. Long ago, before nomenclature became complicated, this was the way it was. From Dayton, Ohio, to the chief signal officer, Sir, I have the honor to report the following progress made by me in learning to operate a Wright airplane. During the week, I've made 12 flights with an instructor and one flight by myself. My instruction, under the personal supervision of the instructor in the machine, is finished. And from now on, all my flights will be made alone for experience. Very respectfully, Henry H. Arnold, 2nd Lieutenant, 24th Infantry. Hap was one of the first qualified pilots in the United States Army. In later years, he never lost the glow of pride and the respect for this symbol of achievement. Hap was the first to win the Mackay Trophy for air reconnaissance. And in 1912, he set a high altitude record of 6,450 feet. In the earliest days of airmail service, he was one of our first couriers. All this experience in the Embryo Aviation Division of the Signal Corps helped him to train others to fly and put him in the front line of those gaining important knowledge about military aviation. Not only better planes and more thorough pilot training, but more men for servicing planes. These were problems which Hap seemed to grasp with a quick understanding. When World War I came, the nation was still only barely aware of aviation's military potentialities. Suddenly, we were in desperate need of trained flyers. From the ranks of the infantry and from all services, men were carefully selected for the aviation section of the Signal Corps. Even more important was our need for aircraft. Administrative problems, including aircraft production, became HAP's responsibility. On the home front, Hap began to learn some lessons that were to have great meaning when he was in command of the Air Force many years later. To produce aircraft for war, one must plan and build long before. Many were the planes and engines finished too late for combat. Hap firmly resolved that America would not be caught short again. With the war over, the nation relaxed. But for Hap and other American airmen, this was the beginning of a battle to convince Americans of the importance of air power. Using some old German battleships as targets, Billy Mitchell showed what precision bombing could do. In the post-war years, Hap was in the forefront of those trying to keep the spark of interest in aviation alive. Sun flying seemed one of the ways. To average Americans, this was worth watching. Meanwhile, there were real steps ahead important to aviation's future. Safer parachutes, for example. Observation from the air became a means of keeping forest fires under control. In the winter of 1932 under Hap's command, there were airdrops of food to the snowbound Indians of the Southwest. This, one of the earliest airlifts, was a prelude to that in Berlin 16 years later. There were also experiments in the field of photo reconnaissance. There was help in the development of new bombers. In these years, Hap was carrying forth the program of building the Air Corps. He was deeply convinced of its military importance. Helping to build the Air Corps didn't interfere with building a lively family. These old home movies show time passing in the Arnold family and pleasantly. They reveal, as do all pictures of Hap, the reason for his nickname, picked up in the days of West Point. <laughs> 
family reflects the dad's good humor, and the dad, growing older and wiser, still exudes the quality for which millions will soon know him. No moniker ever stuck more firmly to a man than to Hap. 1934, the B-10, a new all-metal plane carrying a 2,000-pound bomb load, then the fastest bomber in the world. Under Hap's command, a long-range test flight from Washington, D.C. to Fairbanks, Alaska was undertaken to determine the feasibility of air operations in this part of the globe. Under extreme Arctic conditions, the mission, unusual for its time, was carried out successfully. On his return, Hap was honored with the Mackay Trophy a second time. 1938, on the day before Hitler won a victory at Munich, Major General Hap Arnold was appointed Chief of the U.S. Army Air Corps. Advise our nation to arm for air defense immediately. A strong air force is absolutely essential to keep war out of America. From the beginning, the Commander-in-Chief found in Hap someone he could rely on. He respected Hap's judgment. Together, they saw that time to build and expand had now become precious. Hap's plans went ahead. Planes for ground support, fighter bombers, long-range bombers, fast interceptors, an air force that was both tactical and strategic. Remembering the First World War, Hap pressed for the quantity production of aircraft that would be necessary for a global conflict for a war of far greater proportions than the world had ever known. Each day was important now for building planes, for training men, pilots, navigators, bombardiers, gunners, and ground crews. The race against time was on. In these months, Hap worked tirelessly to mold the Army Air Corps into a fully prepared fighting service. Achievement came in spite of opposition from those who, even at this late date, felt that we were well protected by oceans on either side. Pearl Harbor brought into critical focus the need for huge quantities of aircraft and vast numbers of men to fly and maintain them. Well aware of the time and money involved, HAP had been steadily extending the Army Air Corps training program, coordinating this with our growing air strength. Since 1939, he had fostered the idea of having civilian schools help to train pilots in the first stage. Army Air Corps training had been systematized, and it would include many young men from all walks of life. Not all were needed as pilots, or for that matter, were meant to be pilots. Though some took to the air unsteadily, the huge quotas of trained pilots, mechanics, and other personnel were soon being met. Cap Arnold, a man at a desk with a huge task, requiring long-range planning and careful utilization of our limited air strength on a worldwide battlefield. Early in the war, isolated operations began to foreshadow the future effect of long-range bombing. The daring low-level raid on Tokyo was a carefully designed attack, which brought home to Japan the real meaning of war. The leader of this successful mission, Jimmy Doolittle, was welcomed home by a much gratified chief. Hap always took great pride in the achievement of his men, and they were made aware of his personal interest. In the following months of battle against the Luftwaffe, American pilots demonstrated a kind of bravery that did credit to the Army Air Corps and that heartened the nation. 
Whenever the opportunity afforded, there were frequent visits to his men. Always Hap was received with enthusiasm and affection. No commander was better liked, more deeply respected. As Hap went about the vast problem of building American air power, of deciding what types of planes for what specific purposes, a concept began to form in his mind. Perhaps this concept went back to the day when he first saw the plane in which a Frenchman had flown across the channel. That day when he thought, if one plane, why not many in the air at the same time? Now he saw the huge strength possible in mass formations of long-range bombers, each a fortress in the air. A multitude of flying fortresses in continued strategic bombing of the enemy. Meanwhile, destruction of the enemy air force in combat. Air supremacy. This was his goal. This was the biggest task of his life. With production chief Bill Knudsen, he toured plants and factories. As time went on, as people came to know who Hap was and the job he was doing, his reputation grew. Deadly serious, but always human. This was the way Hap did business. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. You know, doctor, after looking over my audience, I'm going to give my prepared speech back to Captain Sheffield. <laughs> and if you want it, for your record, you can ask Captain Sheffield for it. And I'm sure, I'm sure that he'll be glad to give it to you. Now on with the show. <laughs> I think that you people here are entitled so a little bit of background on this thing that we call air power. Air power. No one was better suited to talk about it than Hap, or better able to put words into action to mold our Air Force into the strongest in the world. Hap's keen awareness of the significance of air power made him invaluable on the international scene. At many conferences, including Casablanca, Hap was able to work smoothly and effectively with our allies. But here, and for months to come, Hap was to argue for an idea that was not particularly acceptable. Mass bombing of the enemy during daylight hours. The plan was not greeted with favor, for at this time the British were successfully carrying out a program of night bombing. While night bombing by the RAF was proving effective, it was Hap's argument that daylight precision bombing could cause far greater devastation than was possible during darkness. On the agenda at Casablanca, were questions as to where the limited number of planes could be best utilized. General Arnold's plans received the green light from the other Allied participants. In the Atlantic, serious damage was being caused by German U-boats. To meet the menace, B-24s were assigned to the anti-submarine command. The number of German submarines harassing our convoys began to decline. In the Far East, there were other problems. Hap went over the air needs of this theater with General Joseph Stilwell and General Chenault. Here it was decided that a difficult flying route over the Himalayas could provide a flow of supplies to the Chinese. The airlift over the hump was one of the extraordinary accomplishments of the war. Hap, as commanding general U.S. Army Air Forces, was a member of the Allied staff, which met to determine the future course of the war. Here at the Cairo Conference and at Quebec, Hap became known for his judgment and common sense. Among leaders of other nations, 
Hap was not only the good-natured man with the encyclopedic knowledge of planes and all matters concerning air power, he was a first-rate diplomat upon whom our military staff could depend. By this time, there was complete acceptance of Hap's daylight bombing program by the Allied Command. Hap had won a personal victory in a difficult realm. Pilots had been needed in large number early in the war, and with Hap's encouragement, a women's branch of the Air Force was organized. The Women's Air Force Service Pilots, known as the WASPs, did a tremendous job during the war, freeing many Air Force pilots for combat duty. At the first graduation ceremony, Hap was the honored guest. August 2nd, 1943, the 9th Air Force carried out the hazardous low-level raid on a strategic target, the Ploesti oil fields in Romania. 177 B-24 liberators from the Tripoli area seriously damaged these important oil-producing fields. In 1944, the program for massive high-altitude air bombardments began to reach its peak. Now, at last, thousands of strategic bombers with new long-range fighter escorts were over Germany at the same time. And now the question was, could this tremendous all-out effort be continued? There was no let-up. There had been thorough planning in every detail that had placed the thousands of planes over Germany at the same time. No one was more instrumental in achieving our long-range plan for strategic bombing of the enemy than Hap Arnold. Through his effort, nothing had been allowed to stand in the way of the plan to use air power to knock Germany out of the war. At the end, we were unmolested in the skies, total air supremacy. At the close of the war in Germany, at the conference in Potsdam, Hap participated in plans for the unfinished work in the Pacific. And after this conference, Hap, with the glow of victory still upon him, recognized the contributions of all the services in the defeat of Germany. This is an appropriate occasion, for we are celebrating tonight the 38th birthday of military air power in the United States. At this time, the newest of the service, services acknowledge the debt it owes to the armies of our land and the navies of our sea. We dip our wings to their glorious traditions, and tonight particularly, I want also to salute all of those who fly and those who make flying possible, be they of the Marines or of the Navy, or in civilian aviation in any of its many forms, or in the Army Air Forces, for they have all played a part in winning this war. Now able to concentrate full attention on the war with Japan, he flew to bases in the Pacific. Friendly and good-natured, he found what he wished to know without seeming to try. Receptive, even-tempered, he was on the best terms with his commanders, extremely sensitive to their problems. Now, according to plan, what had knocked out Germany could do the same in Japan. The B-29, the pioneer of air intercontinental bombers. The plane which, thanks to Hap's convictions and leadership, had been in the works long enough to be ready. 
Three months after VJ Day, General of the Army Hap Arnold terminated 42 years of service. Hap lived to see his greatest dream come true. On September 18, 1947, the creation of a separate service, the United States Air Force. Five years after retirement, his full life came to a close. He was buried at Arlington Cemetery in January 1950. Hosts of devoted friends mourned his passing. Throughout the nation, there was a sense of deep personal loss. There is much to remind us of his role in American air power. This is the Arnold Engineering Development Center at Tullahoma, Tennessee. Not only in name, but in spirit, was General Arnold identified with this center, devoted to research and development in the Air Force, to problems of air and space engineering. Since his time, much has happened, and in many ways, what he stood for has come to pass. It was Hap Arnold who sought the best in aircraft and material, continuous experimentation, development, progress in the air. He was foremost in urging a separate air force for defending America in the skies. It was he who urged a strategic air command, our global atomic striking force, a massive deterrent to the threat of war. It was he who advocated an air force second to none as a means not only of defense, but of preventing another global catastrophe. He saw the need for greater public interest in matters of air power. Without awareness and support, no nation could expect to remain strong. As the years go by, as we move faster and faster in and into the age of space, one influence above all seems now more lasting. It was General Arnold who envisioned an institution to train Air Force leaders, capable of guiding our nation's air defense, whatever the future. The Air Force Academy, and every man who is honored to attend there, is profoundly touched by his influence. Here there is thoroughness and dedication to the task. The standards at the Academy stem in large measure from the example set by the first Air Force leader, who in June 1949 was made the first General of the Air Force. From this academy, that was once his vision, will come other leaders with the training, background and spirit, and with their own vision of what must be done. Such men will help keep America free, as did Hap Arnold. <laughs>